Good afternoon and welcome to the first education all, education all lecture this term hosted by Camborne Village College. It's one of the first of a new wide cross subject range of lectures. My name is Ian Dover. I'm one of the teachers here in at Camborne Village College and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. It's what I, I'm really looking forward to. I think it's going to be an amazing talk having heard our speaker talk before. Um, as part of the series, there's going to be a lecture a week for the rest of this half term, and we're already looking at booking in after the May half term. Next week's is on this topic of astronomy. Um, so please do get come along, share it with other members of your school departments that will be interested, other students that will be interested, and share the wealth of knowledge that we'll have next week. If you have any questions during today's lecture, at the end of the lecture, there'll be a question and answer session, so please do submit them via the chat box that you should be able to view and we'll collate those and pass them to the speaker as we get towards that stage. For anyone joining us from further afield, Camborne Village College is obviously a village college. These were founded in the 1930s in Cambridgeshire by the Education Secretary for Cambridgeshire, Henry Morris. And the aim of them is to work not just for the education of the students, but of the education of the whole community. So it's providing um, access to a range of courses and a range of opportunities, regardless of how old they were, regardless of their occupation, and to make the college a centre of the village or of the town. And so these lectures have been designed to expose our students to the wider community, to academic debate, academic scholarship and having expanded out from the start of a history focus across a wide range of subjects. There's a mix of aims within this. It, we're going to have teachers present. I know I've, there's teacher colleagues looking forward to this as well, building their subject knowledge. We've got students who want to build their knowledge of the subject and show their love of the subject. We've got parents who are interested in just finding out more about how things are developing and how it's different to, to when they were at school it's really great to have that opportunity. Now, the lectures wouldn't be possible without the generosity of the academics who are giving up their time generously to benefit our school, our students, the wider community. So it's a real sincere thanks from myself and the rest of the team to Professor James Holt from the University of Chester, who is going to be talking to us today. James is Professor of Religion. He's involved in the PGC course at Chester University and has spoken on a wide range of religious topics in, to both teachers, to students, um, to wider members of the community. I know he's actively involved in speaking to interfaith groups in the local community as well and um, has a really interesting book on widening our perspective of religions beyond the big six. Uh, so going beyond the six religions that are traditionally taught to make sure we're giving a bigger picture of these things. For any of our students in, in Campbell Village College, we have a copy in school. If you want to have a look at that and to peruse it, please speak to me um, in the next couple of days and I will let you know. James today is talking on the messiness of religion, so I think it's really important in how RE departments and RPE departments are kind of understanding what we should be covering and making sure that we are aware of this and we're helping people understand it. So it's my great pleasure to welcome James to the lecture today and to hand over to him now. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ian, for that introduction and, and thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank Camborne Village College and also Ian and Jess who have invited me along tonight. I'm very excited um, to talk about this. It's something I talk about quite a lot. Um, there are new things for people who've heard me talk in this area before and I'm, I'm very excited to talk about some of the things that surround the messiness of religion and what that actually means. Um, so let me just go through. So I'm going to begin with a line or, or a passage from Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland and it's when she meets Humpty Dumpty. And I think this is important because she has this conversation with Humpty Dumpty and Humpty Dumpty says, when I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be a master, that's all. And so Humpty Dumpty kind of, I don't know if he realises that he's doing this, he's echoing or foreshadowing, I, don't, I can't remember the, the, the timeline, um, a, a philosopher called Ludwig 
Wittgenstein, who said one cannot guess how a word functions. One has to look at its use and learn from that. And he's often summarised, though I don't think he actually said this, don't ask for meaning, ask for use. So sometimes there are words that we use that we ascribe particular meaning to and they change over time or they change based on who's using that particular word in the context. So let me show you these three pictures. These are three pictures that I think are cute. OK, so the um, baby in the top left hand corner, that's just a Google image that I, I found yesterday. And he's I think it's he is a is such a cute baby with such a cute face. My children are all much older now, so I don't get those chubby cheeks um, to, to kind of kiss and, and, and squeeze. And then obviously there's Grogu or baby, Yo baby Yoda. He's cute. And then in the bottom left hand corner, there is Tom Allen, the comedian who is also cute. So then you think, well, hang about. I look at these and I'm afraid I don't really want to squeeze Tom Allen's cheek. So what do I mean? And, and the thing is that cute has two different meanings. OK, so cute can mean, isn't it adorable? Cute. But then it can also mean sharp, quick witted, which is how I would describe Tom Allen as the comedian rather than as someone whose who cheeks I want to squeeze. And so we have to be really clear when we're using language as to how we go about doing it and what we actually mean surrounding it. And sometimes when I use a word, it may be understood in a very different way by somebody else. So why do I start talking about Baby Yoda and Tom Allen? Well, I think it's important because we look at the, the word that we use, which is religion. And if we look at this word that we use today, we know what it means. And we know what it means in 21st century England. We know that it means a system, if you like, of um, or a group of people or a system of beliefs, a way of living, all of those different kinds of things. And so when we look back and we look at, for example, uh, Greek religion or Roman religion in, in ancient times, we imagine that it means exactly the same thing as we mean by it now. And that's not true. There's a, there's a, there's a guy called Brent Nongbury and he's written this book and he looks at it in terms of, and there's other people who do the same thing, who see it as a contested term. That means it's a term that we argue about a lot and what does it mean? And he also argues, I think quite convincingly, that it's a modern construct. It's something, what we understand by religion, probably arose in the 17th century. Before that point, religion kind of, religion and society, religion and culture, religion and politics weren't separate, if you like. They were just kind of all thrown in together. In the first century CE, there's, there's the first use of the word Judaism. But what it means isn't the same thing as we would mean today. And if we look at some of the terms that are in early, and you'll say, well, actually, James, I can read the Quran. I can read Cicero, um, who was a, an early Roman writer um, that wrote before Jesus's time. And each of them use specific terms that are translated as religion. So um, in Latin, it's religio. In Arabic, it's Uma, Din, Mila, all of which mean different things. And then in Sanskrit, it means Dharma. Now, yes, we translate those words in English into English and use the term religion. But when Cicero talks about, it, he talks about perhaps um, certain practices and certain ways of worshipping. When we think about Uma, for example, in the Quran, that is sometimes translated as religion, it has a much broader meaning to do with community and so it's perhaps mistranslated. And then with Dharma, which is used within uh, Buddhism, Hinduism and, and uh, Jain, for example, Dharma is, is very much one's duty. And so to, and, and even that's not particularly helpful um, translation because it's to do with what's in, intrinsic or what's integral to something. So the Dharma of sugar is to be sweet, for example. So the way that we have translated it over the years has kind of Im imposed our understanding. So because we see the word religion, we think we know what it means, but actually we need to consider, well, is that what it originally meant? And 
just to to share kind of this view that, there, that it is a fairly modern construct and um, Brent Longbury in the top quote suggests that it, as a concept in the way that we understand it now it developed in the 16th and 17th centuries and then also if I move on to the last one um, and Peter Harrison suggests that the first recorded use of Buddhism was a, as a word to describe a system of belief was 1801 Hinduism in 1829, Taoism in 1838, Confucianism in 1862, and then um, Josephson uses other religions as well and talks about this. Now, that doesn't mean that there was no Buddhism or there was no Hinduism, and it's just that as a term, it has been used, and in some ways, not in some ways, in, in most ways, it's an outward imposition. I'll explain why this is important, and but one of the most famous writers on religion, Wilford Cantwell Smith, said the process, this process, which is the, the structuring of religion in, in these centuries, in the 19th century, normally took the form of adding the Greek suffix ism to a word used to designate the persons who are members of the religious community or followers of a given tradition. And this process is a colonial construct. And so what happens is people from Western Europe went across to places like India and others and essentially they knew in their head what a religion was because it has a founder, it has rites of, uh, rites of passage, it has worship rites, it has all of those different kinds of things. So it has each of these different kind of pigeonholes um, that things that religions fit into. And what happens is that we go, we, Western Europeans go across, they colonialize places and they name a group of people that kind of loosely fit together. And I think this is most obvious in Hinduism as, as an example, is that, well, it's just anyone that really lives near the river Indus. And at first it, it even included Jains and, and perhaps Sikhs as well. And we have this, okay, well, you're all hin part of Hinduism. And that's really problematic because what we've done and what the study of religion has done and what society has done is they've kind of provided a structure of religion that doesn't it's kind of trying to shove toothpaste into into a into into um a tube. It's very, very difficult and it's not designed to fit after it's come out. And so it, it's trying to codify something or put something into a structure that doesn't fit that structure. We have designed the structure and everything else has to fit into it. And that's problematic. And that's why I think it's important when we talk about the messiness of religion is to recognize the problem of the language that we use. And I'll talk more about this as we move forwards, but that's why it might be, and it seems very simple, and I'm sure if you're in school, your teachers talk to you about, well, this is what religion is, and that's absolutely fine. But at the same time, I think we need to also question the fact that religion fits into these neat little boxes. And I often talk about this as the chocolate box view of religions. And this is quite a lazy way of introducing religions, but it's easy and it and it makes sense, but it's problematic. So most of you, because I'm not old enough to remember these, but when chocolate first came, chocolate boxes were first designed and everything else, what the companies did is they made the boxes beautiful and appealing. And so it was a very static picture, but it was gorgeous. It was, it was, it was one moment fixed in time. And the idea behind it was that if it was a nice box, it would entice people to eat chocolate. I think over time they realized, well, people eat chocolate because it's nice, not because of the box. Um, but that's the way we kind of structure religions, is that we, we put religions into specific boxes and we don't let them kind of express themselves or go outside of those things. So this is kind of the approach within religions where um, all Muslims pray five times a day. Well, actually we know that's not true because for example there are many Shias who will pray three times a day or all Christians believe in a certain thing or all Sikhs are Khalsa Sikhs so there are problems with this but it makes it easy to teach and if I'm honest the first few years of my teaching career 
because before I worked in a university, I was obviously a teacher for a, not lo a, a long time, is this is the way that I would teach because it's easier and it's more straightforward, but it's problematic. And sometimes it's reinforced by people who kind of, I want to say, think they're in charge of religions, essentially. So um, there, are, there are lots of diverse interpretations of religion. There's lots of different ways to be a Christian. There's lots of different ways to be a Hindu and to be a Muslim and all of those things. But sometimes there are communities or there are people in communities who want to establish boundaries and say, no, to be a Christian, you have to do X, Y and Z. And if you don't fit that criteria, then you're not a Christian, you're not a Sikh or whatever. And that's interesting. So I once had a conversation with somebody and we were designing a curriculum for Christianity. And one of the things that I was talking about was the fact that, well, we have to include the idea or that there's diverse or there's different interpretations of the Trinity. So not every Christian believes in the Trinity. But this person who was in charge kind of said, no, um, to be a Christian, you have to believe in the Trinity. Now, I think I understand that people sometimes have that view, but it excluded a large number of other people, such as Latter-day Saints or Jehovah's Witnesses or Christadelphians and, and others. So you think, well, who gives you the right to say what Christianity is? And, and in some ways, this, this kind of same approach is replicated in different religions as well. So I'm doing a lot of reading and a lot of interviews um, with Sikhs at the moment about uh, about Sikhi. And as I explore Sikhi, I recognise that yes, we have, and, and some of you may have watched um, My Life as a Sikh or something like that on BBC last night. And it's really good because it portrays Sikhs as people who wear the five Ks. But interestingly, that is something that developed completely as the only way, almost the, the kind of normative way to be a Sikh in the 19th century with a movement called this, the Singh Sabha movement. Now, that was influenced by colonialism and everything else. But if I was to ask most people who is a Sikh and how do we define Sikhi, it would normally surround the five Ks and everything else, whereas it's much more messy than I think some people would have us believe. And, and so it's not just teachers who have an issue really with trying to kind of pigeonhole religions. I think sometimes in religions, we um, have that same issue so that religious people sometimes say, no, this is the way that it is. It's like, no, there's more than one way to be a particular religion. Religions are, are messy. And sometimes it's it's to do with um, power dynamics that are taking place because some people have much larger voices within um, religious communities. And so they can say, no, this is the way that, that it is to be a Muslim. And, and Alan Bryan, who um, was an Ofsted man with regards to Ari, he talked about, well, he asked the question, do we need to actively question the idea that there is such a thing as true or real Islam? There are just diff lots of different Islams. And then I talk in the bottom, we have to teach big tent religions. We have to recognise this messiness. Even though we may disagree as an individual, we have to teach this messiness. And as, as I said at the bottom, to return to the question of who owns a religion, let me suggest that I don't know, but I know it's not me and I don't think it's you either. So we have to be as, I can't say that word, embraceive as possible, I think. So it's recognising that within this tent of Islam, this tent of Sikhi, this tent of Buddhism, there are lots of different ways. And so if we if we approach it in a way that this is what Buddhism teaches or this is what Christianity teaches, we always have to question our minds. Is it really or is this just one interpretation of it as well? Because religion is, as I say, very, very messy. Now, some of you may have come across this story before, and it's the story of the blind man and the elephant. And as far as I can see, as far as I can find, um, it was originally a Jain story um, to do with um, enlightenment or Kavala Janana, which is kind of achieving omniscience, if you like. And the basic story is that there are six people in this in this version, all of whom are blind and they're arguing about what an elephant looks like. So the first one says oh, it's hard, it's solid, it's like a brick wall. Second one, no, 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 it's sharp, it's smooth. 
it's like a sword. The third one, it's like a snake. The fourth one, it's like a tree trunk. The fifth one, it's like a palm leaf. And the sixth one, it's like um, a rope. Now, all of them are right in their own way, but they're just looking at one perspective. Now, I've seen this used in RE before to just say, OK, well, this is just religion and Christians are looking at the body and Hindus. That's not the way I'm using it because I actually don't agree with that. The way I'm using it is this elephant is Christianity. Or this elephant is Hinduism or this elephant is, is Sikhi. And what we have to do when we teach is we all the different parts of Christianity, if you like, contribute to this. So, for example, if we take the Trinity as, as, as one example, that's probably the whole elephant apart from the tail. But we have to recognise that the tail exists. And that's why some very simple things that we do, um, let me just go back, is to use the phrases many, most and some. So most Christians believe in the Trinity. You don't have to go down a rabbit warren of of kind of um, exploring what it is that Latter-day Saints teach or what it is that that um, Jehovah's Witness teaches. We just have to say most. And that kind of covers all of those bases. Most Muslims pray five times a day. It shows what what, what I would phrase as an intellectual humility. Um, I have been studying religion all of my adult life, so that's 30 years or so. And there's still things that I'm learning anew, sometimes with regard to some of the big six religions, sometimes with regards to religions that are outside of that as well. So we need to recognise I don't know everything about this religion, whoever I am. And so we need to talk about it sensitively and sensibly as well. OK, so this is where the words have power and that's where many, most and some are really useful. Um, and, and we have to look at the way that we talk about these individual religions. So you will have noticed that sometimes I kind of slip between Sikhi and Sikhism. Because as, as Wilfred Cantwell Smith mentioned earlier, an ism is a colonial almost imposition. The most I think obvious in my studies anyway, is Rastafari. Uh, Rastafari is, is a movement of the um, early 20th century, I think, and do not like the phrase, uh, and, and the whole idea, and one of the whole ideas of, of Rastafari is to reject a, a system called Babylon, the Babylon system, which is seen to be the white colonial oppression. And so they very much reject the term Rastafarianism and would refer to themselves as Rastafari. And so there are terms, for example, that we need to be conscious of. And, and there it's it's an it's an interesting discussion and one that's interchangeable. So Sikhism, is it Sikhi, Sikhism or is it Sikhi? Hinduism, is it Hinduism or Sanatana Dharma? Now I've seen some people talk about recently, well, we can talk about it as Hindu Dharma or Hindu Dharma, which I guess goes part way but I think still retains the Hindu part, which is also a colonial um, imposition. There's, there's Buddhism. Now, speaking with colleagues who know far more about Buddhism than I do, they would say, well, maybe Buddhisms because it doesn't quite have the same color, colonial. And then there's paganism. And, and it's interesting, I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago with a student who was a pagan and really doesn't like being described as a religion. It's more a way of life. So we have to consider all of those things. And sometimes when we teach, what we do is we use Christianity as the yardstick. That's the picture in the top right hand corner. And what a yardstick is, is the thing that everything else is measured against. And so that's where we need to be very, very careful. And this is highlighted most to me within Judaism, which if you look in the picture in the bottom right hand corner, this is a picture of the Passover story where um, the Jews or the, or, or the Israelites are commanded to paint um, lamb's blood on their doorpost before so that the angel of death will pass by them. This is from, I can tell, this is from a Christian storybook because nowhere in the Torah, nowhere in the Bible, does it say that they had to paint a cross. But because Jesus is seen to be the Passover lamb, whoever's retold the story or illustrated the story has used Christianity as the yardstick and has interpreted the story in terms of Christianity. So we have to be very, very careful of our biases we also have to be careful of the language that we use and we need to consider. It's not easy. I, I'm writing a series of books at the moment about the six big religions. 
Uh, the first one is, is about Sikhism that I'm writing or Sikhi. But in conversation with my publisher, what they're saying is, well, actually, most of society won't understand what you're doing. And so we're going to title, we're going to have to use those Sikhism, Hinduism terms. So it's not simple, but it takes time. And I think we need to kind of problematize sometimes the language that we use. And also we have to consider that sometimes when we talk about religion, we use what's called a binary. So we use extremes. So um, we kind of split religions into two. So um, I've, I, I've been doing some work recently with a, with a group called C4, which is about farmed animal welfare uh, within Christianity. And, and there are two views within Christianity traditionally. And if you look at the GCSE specifications, this is what it says. There's stewardship, which is looking after the animals, and there's dominion, which is ruling over them. And so it's very easy. And again, it's very clean if we say this. People think this, people think that. Well, that's just not true. There is a whole guy, uh, there's a whole gamut of things in the middle. So I can look at dominion and think, well, actually, yeah, it does mean rule over, but at the same time, it also means a stewardship as well, where we look after. And so by polarizing religions, by kind of separating beliefs within religions, so Catholics do this, Protestants do this, or, or however else we separate them, it misses the messiness and, and it really isn't true. And this is kind of highlighted to me within my experience of Judaism. So I take my students each year to visit Orthodox and Reformed synagogues within, within Manchester. And my students always come away really confused because they think that the Reformed synagogue is more Orthodox and the Orthodox synagogue is more Reformed because they're less concerned with uh, for example, in the reform synagogue, we, uh, the, the men have to wear um, kippahs, the head covering, whereas in the orthodox synagogue, no, you're not Jewish, so it's fine. You don't have to do that. So that it's a lot more relaxed. But when we teach the GCSE specification, sometimes what we do is we kind or I've seen done is we say, well, orthodox Jews do this, reformed Jews do this. And, and it's almost as though we're pitting them against each other. And the reason we do that is it's easier to teach differences like this than it is to say, well, it's a bit messy. So yeah, there are some Orthodox Jews who have bat mitzvahs. In fact, there's many Orthodox Jews that have bat mitzvahs, um, the coming of age ceremonies for women or for girls. But in many textbooks, it will suggest that actually it's only reformed Jews that will have bat mitzvahs for women. So it's 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 a bit messy. And, and that's the point is that it's not as simple as saying, okay, there's a line in the middle, Orthodox for this side, reformed um, for this side. It's that there's shared beliefs, there's all kinds of different ways you'll find reformed Jews who don't keep the laws of kosher, but you'll also meet orthodox Jews who also don't do that thing. And I think that's really key, is that we recognise that religion is a personal kind of approach. It's a lived reality in people's lives. It's not a checkbox on a, on a page, it's not a textbook that kind of says, okay, this is how people live. It's a lived reality. It's it's messy because people are messy, essentially. And this is highlighted to me in a, in, in a book by a man called Matt Green. Um, and the title of the book kind of highlights what it is. He's more of a secular Jew, so he's not particularly observant. And the book is called Jew-ish. And, what, uh, and as he describes his experience of Judaism, um, he describes... Um, let, let me read it. That Jews aren't really a race is an argument beloved by racists and anti-Semites. But a rarer adjacent truth is that Judaism isn't really a religion. You might think it's semantics, but I'd argue it's mechanics. Look under the bonnet of most major religions and you'll find a system of beliefs that's at least internally consistent. The clues in the name, their faiths. But the engine for Judaism isn't faith, it's doubt. What keeps the vehicle moving isn't a belief that it will but the heat generated from a thousand simultaneous disagreements. This might, might sound glib or pedantic, but it's evident in one of Judaism's most foundational facts. Our most sacred text isn't the Torah, the purported word of Hashem, God, but the Talmud. I'm not convinced about that, but let's go with it. A multi-volume text that interprets, expands and comments. Essentially, the Talmud is marginalia, a conversation. What Judaism essentially amounts to is a 4,000 year old argument. Now I shared this quote with my daughter and she remembers as a child watching Yentl, um, which is obviously quite stereotypical and old, 
but it, it, it kind of is people just arguing. And now that's perhaps a recognition and an experience of Judaism that some people wouldn't recognize, but it's his experience of religion. And I think what's key, and there is an approach within RE that um, people may talk to you about called ethnography. And this is the idea that you use individual voices or individuals' voices to highlight what being religious is. So what is it to be Jewish? Well, let's look at what Matt Green says. Let's look at what um, Rabbi Sachs says. Let's look at what um, Joseph from down the street, who is Jewish, says. Look, let's look at their experiences and try to help us understand what it is to be Jewish, rather than learning the kind of headlines and then saying, well, you're not Jewish because you don't do this. And so it's, it, it's kind of very interesting to look at the messiness because individuals are are messy. OK, I'm going to skip over that. One of and, and just still talking about language, I think it's important that when we talk in classrooms, when we talk in society, we, we use things. So if I go back to um, Matt Green, one of the issues I have with what he says is he talks about major religions and well, does that mean there's minor religions? There's certainly majority and there's minority, but mm, so, so there's issues there. And and the author of this, this, this is a really good book. In fact, it came out in paperback today. Um, it's called Once Upon an Eid, and it's a series of 15 people who have written stories about what Eid is and how they celebrate Eid. And, and certainly as I read it, one of the things that I came across was this is just like me when I celebrate Christmas. This is, so, so there are similarities and differences. There's the arguments that happen in any home at a festival time and, and all of those things. But um, the the author um, who I've communicated with says this, this experience is based on her own. And she says, as you can see, she tried to focus on following along in her textbook, when, but when the book described her sect this year's as a radical group that broke away from mainstream Islam because they wanted the Prophet Muhammad's successor to descend from the family line, I grew increasingly uneasy. The word radical made it sound as if she belonged to the wrong side, but there was so much more to the story of her religion's division. So this is interesting because it kind of reinforces the narrative that Sunni is the correct form of Islam and she has just broke off. But actually Shias would say, well, no, we're the correct form of Islam and Sunnis broke off. And then you describing it as radical is, is, I know it can have a positive connotation, but at this point it doesn't, it has a negative connotation. So I think we need to consider the language that we use and the understanding, because as this highlights, the people that we are talking to might have those views. And so it's it, it's important that we become religiously literate, though that's a loaded term, in understanding the diversity and the messiness and just not say this is what it is. Um, and how, how can I say? So one of the one of the messinesses, if you like, uh, I think that hi is highlighted and the problems that this can cause, I think are highlighted by the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. So most Muslims throughout the world are either Sunni or Shia, but there is another group, um, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, who if you meet anybody from the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, they are delightful. Um, they follow the five the Sunni five pillars of Islam. Um, the, uh, their phrase is, is love for all, hatred for none. And but there is a distinction between the Ahmadiyya community and the rest of Islam in the fact that they believe that that the Mahdi has come in in um, in the 19th century, and there is caliphate and people who who follow him in the leadership of the community. So why do I phrase? Why do I use that? Well, actually. The Pakistani um, constitution makes it illegal to be Ahmadiyya. So they're not recognizing that there can be a diversity. They're saying, no, you cannot describe yourself as Muslim. You cannot call it call the place of worship a mosque. And there are penalties to each of those things. So I think that's, I think, a problematic view is that not accepting a diversity within or a messiness within a religion can lead to these types of things. Now, yes, of course, Muslims are free to say, well, or some Muslims are free to say, actually, I don't think Ahmadiyya are 
are, are actually Muslims because of this, this, this and this. But it challenges a person's self-identification and, and certainly when we teach and when we talk, that's how they self-identify and so that's how we talk to them and, and, and certainly that that kind of discussion is replicated within Christianity and other religions around the world as well. So there is a phrase as we, as we come to this, and I've talked about the messiness in the lives of individual, individuals. And um, so there's a phrase that's used and kind of developed called intersectionality. And this was first developed um, by a lady called Williams Crenshaw. And she used it to talk about the intersectionality between being black and being a woman in the United States and, and kind of what that meant. And that's generally what it means, but it can also be led, mean that being a religious person is not as simple as that being your defining characteristic. Yes, it is one of your defining characteristics, but if I think about myself as an individual, um, I am a Latter-day Saint, so a Latter-day Saint Christian. Um, I, grew, I grew up on a council estate, so I'm working class. I'm probably not anymore, and, but that's all of the discussion. Um, I'm English, I'm a man, all of those kind, kind of things intersect to make me the person that I am. And so if you like, when I experience something, which is the white light going into the prism, it is shaped by all of my culture, by all of my experiences, by who I am, and then I translate it into the different colors that come out. So my experience as a Christian, is different even to my wife's experience as a Christian. Why? Because in our intersectionality, she is female, I am male. She grew up in a certain area, I grew up in a certain area. So there's different things that are at play. And that's why the messiness recognizes that for each individual, there is this intersectionality going on. And sometimes there is a debate and there's a discussion in RE at the moment to do with worldviews. And I think that's what that means is that every individual has a worldview where all of those different things kind of converge to express themselves in that way. And so it's it's hard to say that there's a particular one type of Christian because, well, that's just not true because we're all individuals. And this is highlighted to me in an episode of The Simpsons called I'm Going to Praise Land. There's a gas leak at this thing and, they, and, and the people who experience this gas leak all have visions of heaven. So Disco Stew has a, has a vision of essentially the Saturday Night Fever um, disco um, place, club, I guess. Um, whereas the comic book bar guy has an experience where he's um, on the, what's it called? on the Starship Enterprise where he's um, kissing one of the um, ladies on there. So they all have different views. And, and what that shows is the same thing, is that we can all be almost having the same experience, but we interpret it and we, we experience it in very, very different ways. And that's very true for religions as well. We experience religion in different ways based on. Now, I'm going to use an example. So this is the Capitol Riot. Now, for reasons I won't go into, I know that the man who's holding a flag in about the middle, who looks to be dressed in Roman garb, I know that he is a Latter-day Saint. I also know that I completely disagree with what he's doing. I also disagree with his interpretation of my religion. Why? Well, if we go back to this, he's interpreting his view of my religion through an American lens, first of all, also through um, probably a Republican lens, and I don't experience my religion as an American or as a Republican. So we have these different views. Now, do I think he's wrong? Yes, but I recognize his right to have that view because that's part of his experience and who he is. So it's interesting. So I've talked an awful lot and I'm nearly done, I promise. Um, Whatever it is, when we have, whenever we talk about the messiness of religion, it's just recognizing that different people experience religion in different ways. And we can't impose what we understand because we've read it in a book or whatever else be, onto people. And when we talk about religion, I really love this poem from, from Yeats, who says, I've spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly because you tread on my dreams. 
when we talk about religion and when we talk about religion in a classroom or when we talk about religion to individuals, we are talking about some of their most deeply, most sacredly held beliefs. And so we need to tread carefully, not that we're not able to critique, but that we are respectful and that we're understanding and we listening to people's um, viewpoints and their experiences and that we're not actually invalidating their experience, but we're recognizing that this is the way that they experience their religion or worldview within the world that we live in. Thank you so much for all of um, your time and listening to me for, for this 40 minutes. Um, I guess I'll go back to Ian who, who hopefully may have some questions for me. Uh, thank you so much, James. I know um, my notes are copious so far and my wrist is starting to hurt from following along from that. I'm definitely looking forward to watching the recording, which is a nice segue into reminding people that the recording will be available on the website. Um, it'll be tweeted out by the educational um, social media stuff um, once it is up and by our school Twitter account as well. Um, if you do have any questions to so those who are in the audience live, if you are entering after the closing date of the live session, questions may still be responded. Well, they won't be responded to, but you may still be charged in that lovely disclaimer that you get on a uh, game show. Um, so if you've got any more questions, please do send them through now. We're going to run through a couple of them. Um, I think that we've got some really interesting questions on what's going on. So to start off, James, you were talking about how where there's the different perspectives of how uh, I think it was in the Judaism section you talked on um, how the author of the book you had up would have one perspective and the chief rabbi would have a different perspective. And you mentioned the child down the street or the yeah. person down the street. And it's how do we deal with questions where obviously we're talking about a very messy perspective if we're teaching about it or if a student's in a classroom that what is being shared is different to what their personal experience is. And sorry, so and kind of how so either for teachers to respond to it or how students should feel if they see a, a different perspective of something coming across. And, and I think that's really important question. And and I think one of the key ways, and it's the simplest way of all, is the language that we use, which is many, most, and some. And so I'll use as a for example from one of my daughters. So my eldest daughter was in um, her RE class and the teacher said um, all Christians believe in the Trinity. Now she was bolshy enough to put a hand up and say actually miss um, I don't and I'm a Christian and, and a teacher who knows me said you yeah sorry um, Eleanor, I forgot, and and so it was, but but she was able and and to to kind of address that, and so in in using kind of an all or nothing phraseology or terminology, she was excluding my daughter or someone within the classroom who who was from that tradition. But I think if we use most or many, then it it you can then say, well, yeah, I understand that. And that's why I used that terminology. Now, I was perhaps a bit flippant with, with Joseph from down the street, but what I mean is that when we teach, I would, let's say I was teaching um, about Passover, about Pesach. What I might do is I might um, find a book that talks about Joseph's experience of, of um, Passover as a child, or um, I might speak to a Jew or I may even almost construct it, which sounds terrible, um, kind of their experience of what it is to be Jewish and to celebrate Passover. And so what we can do is we can use that experience of Joseph and say, OK, does this fit with what we already know about Judaism? Does this fit with what, what it says in the textbook? Does it fit with this? Does it or? Um, are there differences and might there be cultural differences or might there be um, just family differences as well? So we can, by looking at the different experiences, we can get up to the nub of the celebration of Passover, which is remembering kind of God's involvement in history on the side of the Israelites and maybe the, the belief of um, Shekinah, of, of the imminent presence of the Almighty. And, and one of the problems I think with this approach 
if I think about it more deeply, is that at, at GCSE, when you have to refer to a source of wisdom and authority, then um, Jonathan Sachs, for example, would be a source of wisdom and authority. The Torah, the Talmud would all be, but Joseph down the street wouldn't be and the local rabbi wouldn't be. So there's problems in the way that the system is structured to enable to enable that to happen. But I think it is important to listen to those voices because otherwise we'll say, OK, this is what Jews do on Passover. You get invited to a Passover meal and they don't do that. Are they wrong or are they just doing it differently? And I think that's what we need to kind of highlight. Sorry, I don't answer questions in a short way. Apologies for that. No, that that's fine. Um, the second question was um, uh, obviously at the start, a lot of it was about language and I'm kind of trying to make sure you're aware of where the question's coming from as we go. And you were talking about who chooses who's Christian and the question of the groups that say, well, no, I'm a Christian. You referenced it again later on in terms of Pakistan and the Ayamadi community and ruling out that certain people are or aren't, etc. Is there a danger with the flip side of anyone being able to self-identify as any faith when it comes to things like fundamentalism, extremism, and kind of what we would probably term as negative practices in terms of faith? Absolutely there is, yes, and and that's very problematic. And, and maybe what we need to do in terms of kind of highlighting that problem isn't to say OK, this is the this is this group. Um, this is what they do. And obviously they're not Muslim um, or obviously they're not Christian. But what we do is say, OK, this is what this 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 person practices or does. And this is a way to challenge extremism, really. So this is this is what um, this person suggests. But actually, let's look at it in terms of what we already know about Islam or what we already know about Christianity and say, well, are and, and so we can we can explore that question in the classroom is, are these people living um, a Christian life? Are they living a Muslim life? All of those types of questions that are there. And and, it, and it's strange because you mentioned my book before, Beyond the Big Six, and and one of the one of the criticisms of teaching smaller religions is that sometimes they're dangerous. And so, for example, there's the Westboro Baptist Church, um, who is the one that that petitions and, and kind of pickets with um, at soldiers funerals and things. Now, would I teach that? No, I wouldn't. I would choose not to. But if I were to, because it's such a small group and it has such well, it has has a very loud voice because of Louis Theroux, I think. But but I think I wouldn't go close to that. But if I did, I would say, OK, well, these Claim, the, the, these perhaps suggest that they are Christian, but let's look at the teachings. Would you say that they are? What is it that's most important in defining who a Christian is and what it does? So Justin Martyr, for example, suggested that a Christian is someone who follows the teachings of Jesus. Now, probably if we were to be honest, that would mean that the number of Christians around the world would be very, very small because even as a Christian, I fail at following the teachings of Jesus at some times. So it's I think we if we equip students to kind of explore the controversies and everything else that are within the um, religions, then that's a way to challenge extremism as well. Um, just in doing that process and kind of saying, OK, well, let's let's explore that issue. So and, and that's the problem with kind of the messiness of religion, because there will be some bits of a person's life that are um, Christian or Muslim or Hindu in nature, and then there will be other aspects that are not. So, for example, and, and sorry to denigrate one of my heroes. So, one of my heroes is Martin Luther King. He is absolutely 100% for me a Christian because of the things that he taught, the things that he did. But actually, if we look at his private life, he wasn't um, the most faithful husband, for example. And so we have to recognise the messiness because we have this public figure. We have this person who is no doubt um, a Christian, but at the same time, some of the things that he does are unchristian. And so recognising the mess messiness and the intersectionality and everything else that's going on. We almost dissect individuals to say, well, there are aspects that are not and there are aspects that are. I don't know if that answers your question, but 
hopefully so. I, it's, it's a really good answer. I think the, the final bit about dissecting the person is something that's come up fairly relatively in the news recently in the news in how kind of like even going back to the ancient Greeks that some people who've come up with great ideas have been awful people and we shouldn't necessarily throw out the great idea because they were an awful person but we should highlight the fact that they weren't necessarily the nicest person at the same time yeah. um, and that's happened throughout history I think so it helps kind of build that picture around. Um, next question in terms of kind of the language used again is you've used lots of kind of references to pop culture most of which go over my head because I'm not the most um, cultural person in the world in terms of modern modern ideas um, but you've done that to help us kind of tag our ideas to different ideas using kind of analogy or metaphor to help us, us pin it and you've also then said that one of the issues with study of religion is that we use Christianity as a yardstick. Is it, um, and I'm going to refer to Tom Holland's um, work, I don't know if you've read his stuff on Dominion, um, his book Dominion, but he looks at how Christianity has been so pervasive in Western culture as kind of an underpinning that everything is automatically seen through that prism. Do you think, and you can feel free to plead the Fifth Amendment on this and not answer I think, but do you think that when we've tried to view religions through the prism of Christianity, that's because it's what people know and understand in British culture. And therefore it's a way to try and understand something that could be very complex due to limits of curriculum time or school age or things like that. Yeah, and I think you're right. I mean, it's a very conscious decision, as you suggest, for me to use these, these kind of pop culture references. So at heart when I teach I'm a constructivist so I, I use things that as you say people can hang their hat on and using Christianity of which many people within Britain will have that um, experience not in terms of being a Christian necessarily but because they will have observed it because that's the way that our school year is, is um, structured so we have Christmas holidays we have Easter holidays we go into shops we will see all of those things so so it is possible to use them as a springboard to something else um and and I think maybe this is this is more of a nuance that I need to think through a little bit more but at the same time what we shouldn't do is use it as the yardstick against which to judge other things now this is a discussion because while I would never say for example Vesak um, is the Buddhist Christmas? Well, no, it's not. And so that's wrong. But I might say, well, you don't understand what Vesak is. So let's talk about how how Christians celebrate how Christians celebrate Christmas. And then what we do is we say, well, actually, it's for Buddhists, it's kind of similar when we look at Vesak. But what's really, really important is that we, as well as recognize the similarities, is we highlight the differences. So I think if we do use Christianity as a springboard, and as you say, it might be our default lens, we have to recognise that we're interpreting it in a different way and it doesn't mean quite the same thing. And we, we do. So if we do use it, just as I would use. So when I introduce symbolism to year one, I would use a McDonald's symbol. So I'm trying to help have them understand, for example, that the cross means something more than it just being uh, uh, something on the page. So I would start with a McDonald's symbol. Now I'm not saying that the McDonald's symbol is the same as the cross because it has much deeper, the cross uh, that is, has much deeper meaning, but what I'm using it as a springboard. So it depends on how we're using it. If we're using Christianity to judge other things and to kind of normify Christianity and say, well, this is, a, it, it's about recognizing the similar similarities and differences. But I recognise that in doing so, I may be being hypocritical in that way. So it's it's something to think through. So that's a very interesting question. Thank you for that. I think in your reference to your um, book series that you're writing, I think it's one of those really interesting ones that even in like for those students that aren't necessarily at that age and are listening along, that the GCSE specifications have very similar kind of touch points in terms of beliefs, practices, worship, etc that is built on that kind of Christian framework and possibly shouldn't be. Whereas making the reference to it to put it in context is probably something slightly different, but it's. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting because 
it's not actually an exam boards that came up with that content. Um, the Department for Education came up with that content in conversation with the faith groups. Now that does raise a very interesting question is which faith groups or which representative representatives of those faith groups did they consult and did they go with the framework and say, OK, we've got beliefs, we've got practices, we've got sources, wisdom, authority. Tell us what fits into those. And so what the faith communities probably did is say, OK, well, this goes here, this goes there. And it's very interesting because I was involved in the writing of one of those specifications and I moved around some of the content so that it flowed better and that, that it, and, and the message we got back was you don't mess with where that content goes. It has to go in this particular section, which I think showed a particular interpretation from government rather than the exam boards. That's fascinating. I've had conversations with Ofqual myself about kind of the, the, the way the content is structured. It's fascinating to see kind of the, the movement in the background and it's similar to the movement you talked about in kind of the messiness of religion that there's someone who kind of is moving in the background and kind of arbitering these things in some way, shape or form throughout history. Um, one final question then in terms of you obviously you're clear about the fact that we should be engaging with this messiness of religion and that there is a limit in terms of time and using the phrases of um, most and many and some would be an idea. Do you think we should be implementing this kind of diverse approach very early on or in the way that you answered the question about Christianity earlier with um, the idea that do they follow the question, um, the teachings of Jesus as opposed to these tenets of faith that have been built up years later? Is it a let's look at these core teachings, whether it's from scripture or whether it's from following the person and what they mean and then look at how they've been applied in different ways and that kind of comes later on so that there's a solid foundation? Um, I think if we look, for example, at the primary curriculum, I think it's important that that you do kind of start with with kind of the, almost what seems to be the the fuzzy outline, if you like, the the kind of non-negotiables or the things that seem to be the centre of of the religion, which is important. But I think you can still, in teaching those things. So, for example, let's say you're talking about baptism within Christianity, and you're doing that with year two, and you're talking about well, this is what happens in a baptism ceremony um, when a child is baptised within or christened within the Church of England. I think there's a couple of things. One is highlighting that it's the Church of England. And I think the other thing, if you're going to talk about Christianity, is that there's many people within Christianity who baptise children. So just by using that terminology, you're not going down a rabbit warren, you're not causing confusion, but, but just in the language that you're using of many, most and some, you're automatically implanting, that sounds really bad, implanting in children the idea that what you're saying is not the complete thing that we can just by saying there are many Christians who baptize children automatically you can kind of think well there will be some that will baptize adults or who don't baptize children or whatever those that, that kind of thought process is so I think even at the very earliest of ages we can messy religion up just by the language that we use now obviously as you say the more in depth well, there's doubt, this is the way that, for example, the Trinity is interpreted, or this is the way that baptism happens, or this is the way that prayer happens within Islam. At different stages as children progress, they will naturally engage with um, kind of the diverse interpretations that you will come across. But I think even at the very earliest of ages, you can talk about um, many, most and some. I hope that answers your question. Excellent. Thank you very much. There's one that has just popped up in the last minute as well. So I'm going to tag it on. I know we're getting close to five o'clock as it has just ticked over, but um, I'll ignore Jess for the minute and make sure we can get it in. So could the ism being used as in terms of Hinduism, Sikhism, Buddhism, uh, can it be used to actually enhance the messiness of the religion? For example, I can say Sikhs believe in Sikhi, but in the classroom where we're teaching different types of being religious, we can use the word Sikhism as a way to refer to everything that relates to Sikhi. A little bit as Christianity is an encompassing term to refer to the different ways of believing in Jesus. Many believers won't say I'm a Christian, but they use the specific term, say I'm a Roman Catholic or I'm an Anglican or a, 
a Latter-day Saint to refer to their specific idea. And yeah, I don't, I, mean, I don't know. I've not thought about that because, I mean, there are different ways to refer to Sikhs, for example. So there's there's Amrit Dari and there's or, the, or Khalsa Sikhs, or there's Kesh Dari, which and then, and then there's others. So we have different ways of referring to different types of Sikh. But I think in, I, this is where I almost contradict myself because although, yes, I would prefer to use the term Sikhi and I'd prefer to use the word Sanatana Dharma and, and, and kind of things surrounding those, I think it's very hard to strip away that however many hundred years of colonialism and also within society, where people talk about Sikhism or talk about Hinduism because people understand what that means. So I think this is a generational thing where maybe in if we start talking in that way now and, and kind of using both interchangeably, then in 30 or 40 years time, we may be at a place to just use one. Um, but, I, but so I don't think it's wrong. This is terrible. I don't think it's wrong to use those terms at all. And I think it will perhaps confuse more than help to use some of the, the additional terms. Um, but I do think as children get older, we need to recognise the problem, the problematic nature of those terms and that we're kind of making a religion a monolith by making it an ism. So it's, it's an interesting question that I've not thought through and I think I need to give more thought to, if I'm honest. So sorry, it's a bit of a blur response, but, but I think that's why I need to leave it, I'm afraid. Uh, that's fine. I know I personally I struggle because we look at census data in some of our lessons with year sevens and obviously that has Hinduism, Sikhism and Buddhism listed, but we also look at the changing language of it and we use the the, the different terms like Sikhi in lessons and we have to we have to draw that parallel for them because otherwise it seems like two different things and it it's not going to be an easy thing. So I mean just as you mentioned the census, that's really interesting about recognizing the messiness because for example, within uh, within paganism, there are lots of different types of pagans. So there's pagan, there's Odinist, there's Wicca, and there are in you can write that in for yourself. Whereas when I write into the census, and I don't, I just put Christian because it's easier. Um, if I put into the census the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, they automatically just lump that in with Christianity. So it's interesting that for some religions they lump everybody together, whereas for other religions, they are very happy to separate those out. So the census data is, yeah, is doesn't always recognize the messiness um, of religion either. So it's, it, it's kind of an interesting tool that's used. I did not know that about the grouping together of different denominational ideas, because I saw the humanist um, campaign this year about making sure they take no religion instead of writing things in because it didn't get necessarily get grouped. But I didn't realise the Christianity ones did. Yeah, I mean, the no religion one's another interesting one because you can put no religion, but then within that you can also put atheist, humanist and, and so on. And humanists in the 2011 census, I think, had about 60,000 at the very most. Maybe it was 16,000. So it was a very, very small number. But obviously no religion was much bigger. So there's a messiness of no religion as well as there's a messiness of religion as well. Um, I only know because I, I, I asked the question about um, my faith is if someone wrote that, where does it get stuck? And it, it, it gets put within Christianity, which I'm very happy with. I'm not, I don't have to stress with that. Um, but it but it will be interesting to see which other religions. So Ravadasya, for example, was very clear that they wanted to be separate as opposed to Sikh, which you could suggest they came from. So it's, it's interesting. Sorry, I've, I've gone on again and we've gone over. Oh, no, I mean, it's, it's I, I could stay here for hours um, talking about it because I find it all absolutely fascinating as we go through these things. Um, I am aware that obviously it is advertised to be four till five and we're just going over. We have no other questions at the minute. Um, for the attendees, can I just um, remind you in the, the chat, you should have hopefully seen um, links coming through about a feedback form. It only takes a couple of minutes. It's really valuable to us both at Camborne Village College just to sort through um, how these sessions are being understood and how they're taken and they'll be sent out via Twitter as well. Um, and if you've got any comments for um, James Holt, we will pass those on to him as well. Um, I know that how, all the books that he's referenced in the um, 
presentation I've already got on the bookshelf, which I feel really happy about. I just need to go back and reread them and make sure I'm uh, utilising them properly and not using them as paperweights, which happens when I buy a massive supply of books. Um, so it just leaves me to say thank you very much for your time this evening, James. I know obviously um, you're giving up not just the hour here to present, but the time to prepare and make sure you're ready to to provide this insight to our students and the wider community and it'd be very valuable for them. So thank you very much. Fab, thank you for having me. It's been great. And then finally, the recording will be up online hopefully soon and we'll share that out widely as soon as we can. Thank you very much for your time, everyone.